We've been talking for weeks about the hidden life in Christ and digging deeper into finding Him. We're not done with that project yet. It may be Easter and we might be finished with that sermon series, but we have an opportunity for you to be intentional, to set aside time to be with Jesus, time to be with your sisters, time to be the body of Christ, and to do all of that as we dig deeper and learn more about Jesus and what it looks like to be Jesus hand and feet in our lives right here. So we wanna encourage you to sign up, to come to the women's retreat, Smuggler's Notch, the first weekend in May, the 4th, 5th, and 6th. The signups are out in the lobby. So who's your hero? Who is it that you're counting on to come through? I, I've been spending some time with, uh, with an avid Red Sox fan, and all I have to do is even get close to the subject of the Red Sox, and I get the whole report on what happened in the last game, what happened, well, your mother is probably still doing the same thing, right? No? Uh-huh, yeah. And there are probably a few of you. And I'm already learning the names of the new we hope will be the people we hope will be the heroes uh, as uh, somebody steps up and, and, and uh, fills the gap left by somebody else. You know, sometimes when we think about our heroes, and when maybe whether it's a, a situation in, our, in our, work, our work lives or in our personal lives, or maybe it's something in, in uh, the fate of our nation or even the fate of a, a team that we love, uh, we compare the, the person we need now with some great hero that had filled the gap in the past. And we sort of model our expectations on hoping that that great hero from the past would somehow come back in a new form. You know, I know every, um, you know, every, every sports team has probably a few numbers that have been retired uh, because those players were so great that there'd never be another one like them. And when you see those jerseys or you see those numbers up in the stadium, uh, everybody's hoping that there'll be somebody that will, will have those same gifts and bring them to a new challenge. And that's the situation that a man named Peter faced when he stood in front of thousands of people to announce the coming of a new king. They were looking for a hero. Uh, they were looking for someone to be like the greatest hero that they had ever, ever known of, that their, that their nation had ever experienced. His name was David. And if Peter was going to explain that King Jesus was present, and if Peter was going to explain what it meant for King Jesus to be present, he would have to go through King David. He couldn't talk about a king. He couldn't talk about God working through a king without talking about the one king that they knew and the one king that they most admired, their greatest hero. All that he had to do to bring up King David was mention the name. And you know, when he mentioned the name, everybody could fill in all the rest. Now, isn't that kind of the way it is? If you're a Patriots fan, all you have to say is Tom or the goat, and it's done. Everybody can go relive how many touchdowns and how many Super Bowls and, and how many you know, two-minute drives and so on, uh, because um, we already have the stories in our head. And so when Peter had to go, had to bring this idea of who the new and greatest hero could ever be, this person, King Jesus, all he had to do was just mention David and everybody could fill in all the rest. David was the shepherd boy who killed a giant with a stone and a sling. He was the hero who time and again defeated the dreaded Philistines uh, who had been terrorizing the Israelites for uh, decades, if not hundreds of years. He was the desert warrior who successfully evaded a king's army for 10 years, living out in the desert. He was the newly appointed king of Israel who captured a city that had been thought to be impregnable, the city of Jerusalem. He was the ruler who expanded Israel's borders and subjugated surrounding kingdoms, created a little mini empire there in that part of the Middle East. But he was also known as a man after God's own heart. He's the one that brought the Ark of the Covenant, which represented the very presence of God, and brought it all the way from where it was out at 
somebody's house out in the countryside right into the city of Jerusalem, dancing, he himself, in wild celebration all the way. He was Israel's greatest songwriter, crafting the psalms that we sing and pray to this very day. In short, there wasn't anybody like King David. There wasn't anybody who sort of had it going in every possible area if you're going to be the king of God's people. So it's no wonder then that Peter's listeners were already avidly looking for a new King David. If you'd asked any of them what their greatest hope was, what the only way was that Israel could be rescued, that the Jewish people could be restored to their proper place, that the promises of God could come true, they would have said, well, we need another King David. We need a David. We need a son of David. We need somebody that follows in David's line and does what David did back then for us now. We need a David who will slay the giant of Rome. We need a David who will liberate the holy city of Jerusalem. We need a David who will bring the presence of God back to his people and back to the temple. We need somebody to do what David did back then. We need it right now. And that's why the road to King Jesus had to go through King David. So Peter does just that. He introduces David in the middle of a sermon that he's preaching on the day of Pentecost, and he quotes one of David's psalms. In, psalm, in Acts chapter 2, verse 25, he says, David said about Jesus. So he's saying, okay, you guys are looking for King David. My job is to tell you about King Jesus. Well, let's start with David, right where you know, you know who he is. You, he's valuable to you. If he says something, it's got to be true. David said about King Jesus, I saw the Lord always before me. Because he's at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest in hope because you will not abandon me to the realm of death. You will not let your Holy One see decay. You've made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. Then Peter states the obvious. These glorious words about victory over death could never have been applied to King David. Listen to these words. We go back over them. My body will rest in hope because you will not abandon me to the realm of death. You will not let your Holy One see decay. You've made known to me the paths of life. Beautiful words. You might read them and say, oh, yes, well, that means that David escaped uh, being killed at such, such a time in his life, and maybe he recovered from some illness, or uh, maybe he won a great battle when things were looking bad. Maybe that was about the giant when he stood there and the giant was going to kill him and he killed the giant instead. But we all know how King David's story ended. At a very old age, he passed on like everybody else does. Peter points out in verse 29, Fellow Israelites, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried and his tomb is here to this day. So let's talk about David, he says. David said a beautiful thing about conquering death. David said a powerful thing about a body not being left in the grave and decaying, about being shown the paths of life. But if you really think about David, while he had a long life, he's not here today. He died just like the rest of us. I can just see Peter pointing down over his shoulder saying, and you know where, he, right down there is where his, his tomb is. You walked by it on your way to the temple this morning. Instead, Peter says, David was pointing to someone greater. And he goes on in verse 30 to say, but he was a prophet. David was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. So there's going to be another king. God had promised David, there's going to be a king after you. Seeing what was to come, David spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor did his body see decay. Yep, David was a great king, and more than that, he was a prophet. God could talk to him. He could hear God speaking to him, and he could speak for God. But David prophesied the coming of someone far greater than David. You see, the road to King Jesus goes through King David. Not just because we need to have a comparison. Not just because people only knew about David, but because God chose to work through David. 
and go from David the king, a mighty earthly king for a few years, to a king that would be the king of the whole world. And so Peter says, yeah, David prophesied that one day God would raise up someone and conquer death, but it didn't happen to David. And David, as David also prophesied when he was saying those words that this was really about God's Messiah, God's ultimate king, the one through whom God would rescue his whole world. Do you ever notice how sometimes it's hard to let go of something good for something better? Even if it means you know, that when you make the switch, you're going to be so glad that you did. Uh, there's a commercial there for those of us of a certain age. Did you ever see that one where they all sit around? It's an insurance company commercial. There's a bunch of folks in their 50s or maybe 60s or whatever sitting in a circle. And it's a support group for people who are becoming like dad. You know, and they go around and they say all the kind of things that you promised yourself you would never say. And they're wearing, you know, the Birkenstocks and this and that. I mean, all the stuff from another age. And then, you know, the situation, one guy's holding up the flip phone and says, why should I get rid of it? It still works. And, you know, sometimes we can fall into that mindset. We get so used to things being a certain way. We get used to what we have. We get used to how we do things. We get used to what we know. And then something unbelievably better comes along. And we're going, yeah, 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 but this still works. I don't know how many times I tried to text on a flip phone. I mean, that has got to be the hardest thing in the world. First of all, the little numbers are too small. Second of all, if you want to have the letter C, what do you have to do? And then you want to have, you got to go play the little, bing, bing, bing. is it two times? Is it three times? And you're painstakingly creating a word. I got a word. Where's the space? And I mean, and then the, there's this kid next to you. I said to my grandson, can you text without looking at your phone? Oh, yeah. I'm like, I like to give him my flip phone and see how he does. <laughs> but why should I get rid of it? It still works. And you see, people in, in Peter's day would have said, oh, what's wrong with King David? He beat our enemies. He killed the giant. He conquered the city. He built an empire. He brought the presence of God. I mean, it looks to me like he got it all done. Did the whole job description. Every single thing we needed. So why not just do it again? And Peter's saying, flip phone to smartphone. Yeah, David was good, but he pointed to something so much better. So he says, look, David promised there'd be a future king who would not be left in a grave, who would rise from the dead. And then he says in verse 32, God has raised this Jesus to life, and we're all witnesses of it. This Jesus? Jesus was a common name, by the way. There wasn't just like one Jesus, okay? There were zillions of Jesus. And they meant Joshua, so Joshua was an, another one of those heroes, one of those retired jerseys, right? And so... People named their kid Joshua, whole thing that God would raise up another Joshua, conquer the land and do all that kind of stuff. So he had to be specific. He said, this is this Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth, the one that was crucified uh, out of all the other people named Jesus. He said, this Jesus God raised to life, and we're witnesses of it. And you can see the crowd, because they've been following. They're with him on this David thing. And oh, yeah, David talked about something greater. Ooh, ooh, another bigger David. Ooh, that's good. Ooh, a really powerful David, a David that can't die. Oh, that's awesome. And then he goes, dot, 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 ends up with Jesus. Can you see the look on their faces? You mean the guy who rode the donkey into town just before the Passover? The guy that created a riot right here in the temple? The guy the temple police arrested and brought to the Roman governor on charges of rebellion against Rome? The false prophet that was crucified just outside the city walls, that guy? You're talking about him? <laughs> See, the road from King David to G King Jesus has to go through King David. You start with David, you come to Jesus, but boy, it's a big jump to go from the one to the other. Peter says, yep, that's the one, no other. We saw him with our own eyes after God raised him from the dead. You may have convicted him as a blasphemer, 
and a false prophet, but God overturned your verdict and declared him innocent of all charges. Not only that, but he made him the rightful king over the whole world. He and he alone is the only one that fits the David prophecy. He's the one who was not abandoned to the realm of the dead. He's the one who was not left to decay in a garden tomb. David, by the way, decayed in his tomb. Go check it out. But not Jesus. He's opened the way to the paths of life. And that makes Jesus the Messiah, which was the Jewish word for the king. And Peter goes on to point out that this is no ordinary earthly king. This is not just like another David, like we took the number out of retirement, you know, and we finally found a player so good that he can wear that number that we thought no one would wear again. He said, no, this is not just another earthly king. This king is enthroned in heaven itself. Look what he says in verse 33. Exalted to the right hand of God, he's received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you see and hear. Now, Peter's sermon began, if you go back to the, to the early verses of this chapter, with an explanation of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Uh, what the young people experienced uh, yesterday and the day before, and they're talking about the experience of the power of God, was something that for the first time was experienced by everybody that in the room. <laughs> and they were having their version of the youth convention in that upper room, you understand. And the Holy Spirit came and just empowered these people. And they went out and they began to share and people were stunned that this new power of people speaking in other languages that they could understand and they could see the excitement and see the enthusiasm. These people ought to be hiding. After all, Jesus was a criminal and now they're out there pronouncing that he's king of the world. And they're going, what's going on? And Peter said, well, what's going on is the Holy Spirit came. Well, now he gets to the explanation of how and why the Holy Spirit came. Holy Spirit came because Jesus is not just king of a kingdom, not just king of a little ethnic group, not just king for the next 20 years, but he's the king of the whole world. He's sitting at the right hand of the Father. And he's poured out the Holy Spirit. I mean, what, that means, what, that, what does that mean, to pour out the Holy Spirit? It means that the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead has now been let loose in a broken, dark, and messed up world. Right there in the middle of all the problems and all the troubles and all of the confusion and, and all of our own brokenness, the new creating power of God is let loose. You see, when the Spirit was poured out, it wasn't just so some people would have some gifts. It wasn't just so some people could have a moment of feeling elation or excitement. This is God remaking his world, one person at a time. One broken place in our lives at a time. One heartache at a time. Remaking us in the here and now as part of the big plan that will one day include the entire world. And Peter says, hey, guess what? David called this one too. David quotes finally in verse 34. He says, for David did not ascend to heaven. Yet David said, David the prophet now, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Huh, where is the right hand of God? Well, certainly not in Jerusalem. Now, you can't build a temple big enough for God. This is God saying that my ultimate king will rule at my side from heaven. This will be a king for the whole world. This will be a king for all peoples. And David said in the psalm, the Lord said to my Lord, and that creates a kind of wordplay thing going on. Because now you've got the word Lord being used side by side. This Lord that God the Father is speaking to, Peter says, is King Jesus. This is how he sums up his sermon, the last words of the sermon, verse 36. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus... Yeah, that guy. <laughs> that guy you thought was a fraud. That guy you thought was a, was, a, was a blasphemer. That guy you thought was guilty. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. Lord and Christ. Now, the Lord, word Lord means more than just king. It means more than just a ruler. It's more than just an honorary title. 
In the Jewish faith, the word Lord refers explicitly to Israel's God, Yahweh. At the very beginning of Peter's sermon, he quoted a verse from the Old Testament that said, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And of course, everybody understood, well, he's talking about the one true God, the God of Israel, Yahweh. That's the God that they prayed to every morning when they said, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. This is the God who gave the Ten Commandments. This is the God who created the covenant with his people. So when the word Lord was spoken, they're thinking, Lord, that's the name for God. Well, now, working through David's prophecies, Peter has brought us to the place where he can say, The Lord that you call on when you're in a time of need is King Jesus. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified both Lord and Christ. The great confession of the very first Christians was to say Jesus is Lord. And that meant taking an amazing leap, taking an amazing journey whereby they came to understand that God made himself known in Jesus. And that when you meet Jesus, when you call upon him, when you trust him, when he comes to live in you, the great God of heaven is the one that you have met. And the great God of heaven is the one through his spirit who comes to live inside of you. And that was God's plan all along. Now, back in the summer of 1988, Yellowstone National Park experienced its worst fire season in history. For many, many decades, uh, uh, the park had been governed by the idea that you put out all the fires. Well, you put out all the fires, and of course stuff grows, and then it dies, and then it lies there. And so the the park was filled with fuel. In fact, the rangers had tried to sort of burn down some of that fuel, but then the weather took a turn, became very, very dry, hot winds began to blow, and the little fires here and there all began to explode into massive fires. Uh, In the end, 36% of the park was affected by the fires. In some cases, burned right down to the ground. Other places, uh, lower level fires. But 36%, over a third of the park was burned. 800,000 acres, if you can imagine that. And the fires left nothing but blackened stumps and ash-covered ground. Uh, those of you who might remember seeing the pictures, you know, we, we, we all wondered, is that the end of Yellowstone? <laughs> what happens to Yellowstone National Park? I mean, will it ever recover? But as soon as the fire burned out and the ground cooled, the recovery began. Wildflowers bloomed profusely, for they say, for the next five years. They had flowers like they'd never seen them before. Many plants regrew from existing sprouts that had survived the heat of the fires. Now, the main tree there is the lodgepole pine. And the lodgepole pine has a pine cone, because it's a pine, uh, but has a funny kind of pine cone. The pine cone won't open and disperse its seeds unless there's been a fire. It takes hundreds of degrees of temperature to cause that cone to pop open. And guess what happened after the big fires of 1988? (laughs) Lodgepole pine cones started popping all over the place. And you can see there on the left-hand picture the little baby trees all coming up through the dark, the black stumps. You might wonder what happened to the animals. Actually, the animals did pretty well, according to what I was, had been reading. And they did even better after the fire because all the new growth was right there for grazing. And so the animals even recovered. A fire that had seemed an unmitigated disaster became the starting point for new life. And I wonder how often we see the forest fires sweep through our lives or sweep through our community and wonder if God will ever come and make things right. Whether you're going through a personal tragedy or whether you're facing uh, uncertainty. Some of our folks have been going through uh, a battle against deadly diseases uh, over the last year. I mean, it hasn't been just something that came up and then kind of went away, but it's been months and months of chemo and months of radiation and, and then the tests that come afterwards and all of the changes in life. We pray this morning for families that have lost young people. I mean, none of us 
uh, who have not been through that experience can even begin to imagine uh, the devastation that that represents. We look at our community and we look at the statistics of what are happening, what's happening to the young people, not only in Vermont, but across our country with the opiate uh, epidemic and with the, the number of people that have died. I mean, thousands and thousands and thousands of people. I remember as a young man coming to terms with the reality of the Vietnam War, as a young a teen, I used to go to the uh, football games at the Princeton Stadium, the Princeton University Stadium. We, a, a man in the church had brought us on as ushers. <laughs> well, we were great ushers. Well, we were way down the far end. We never got to ush very many people, but we got to watch a lot of games. And I remember knowing that there were 50,000 people in that stadium on a big game. And when the numbers came out about Vietnam and we learned that 50,000 uh, young men died in, in Vietnam, I had a way of picturing that. I thought, well, that means like all the people that were in the stadium for a given game, that many people died in that war. And now we're told that more than that die every year here in our country. In the prime of life. Not because of a war, but because of the scourge of this, this uh, horrible epidemic. And we look at that and it just can seem like a firestorm that just has ripped through and we wonder, will, will America survive? Will we survive? What will happen to our country and to our culture and to to our world. Where is God in the midst of all this? And if God were to come and fix it, wouldn't he come like a mighty king, mowing down his enemies and just making things right and getting rid of all of those things that cause such terrible problems? Well, Peter wants us to see that God did come. God has come, and God is here. He came in the person of King Jesus, the fire did its worst. The fire did its worst to Jesus, God's only son, left him dead in a borrowed tomb. But on Easter morning, the first shoots broke through the ash and soot. You see, the fire had actually cleared the way for a whole new world, God's new creation. God looked at all the forces of evil and said, take your best shot. Be like a fighter who would stand there, put his hands behind his back, and just say, go ahead, hit me as hard as you can. And to all of us watching our hero, we'd be saying, no, no, fight, put him up, take him down. And our hero stood there and said, take your best shot. Blow after blow fell upon Jesus until he was left unconscious on the mat. And it seemed like, well, that was the end of that. But when he got up, when he rose, it became clear that death had taken its best shot and it didn't have anything for Jesus. Had nothing for him. You see, that's how you conquer death. And that's how God conquers the things in our world. He comes into those places where it seems that the fire has burned and he says, watch the life grow. Now, how does that happen? Well, it happens when we choose to take this journey of discovery and discover King Jesus. Maybe for the first time, maybe in a new place and a new time in our lives. Now, if you're going to find King Jesus, you've got to leave behind your earthly kings. You've got to leave all your other heroes <laughs> in some other part of your life. They cannot compare. You can't compare who Jesus is with what this world says is a hero. It means putting our total trust in a king who died on a cross with a mocking sign over his head, King of the Jews, ha, ha, ha. It means believing those eyewitness reports of those who saw him raised from the dead. It means daring to believe that he and he alone is king in heaven right now. And most of all, it means seeing that he is God himself made known to us. Everything you'll ever need all of the power you will need for your life, all of the wisdom you will need for making decisions, all of the love, all of the comfort, all the forgiveness, everything you need is there in him, and he's here right now. King Jesus is here in the presence of his Holy Spirit. He's here to rescue us. He's here to save. All we have to do is make our spiritual 911 call. That's all we have to do. 
Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Let's bow our heads together. Father, right now, there are those of us who need to make that spiritual 911 call. There may be someone here in this room right now or watching on the video who has never yet called on the name of the Lord Jesus so that they could personally be rescued from their sin and from death and become your child. And so, Lord, I just want you to speak to them right now and give them the courage. Give them the courage to take out that spiritual phone and to just to punch those numbers, nine, one, one. Lord, here I am. I can see that I need to be rescued. I can see that this is never going to work on my own. I cannot fix this problem. I've been hoping this world would come along with a hero, would come along with a king, would come along with somebody who would fix it. But now I see that it comes from you. It's right here in the middle of my forest fire and all of the ash and soot that you want to bring new life. I'm calling to you, great God of heaven, Lord Jesus. And with your heads bowed, with your eyes closed, if there's anyone here who is saying, I need to do that right now. I need to make Jesus my personal Lord and Savior. I'm going to ask you, let me know by just, just raise your hand for a minute so I can see you. Is there anybody here? There's one right here. There's two. Yeah, anybody else? Thank you. Anybody else? Wow, let's pray for these folks right now. Father, I just pray for these folks who have raised their hands right now. There is nothing more important that will happen today or any day than that they become your child and know that they are your child. So, Lord, I just pray that you would just speak right into their hearts that as they put their trust in you, the risen king, conquered death, that, Lord, they become your child. You forgive them of their sins and you open the door to a place in your kingdom right alongside of you. And I just pray that for them now. Pray that they would reach out. We could, we could help them continue that journey in Jesus' name. Now, how about the rest of us here? Say, oh, well, I've accepted Jesus as my Lord. I've accepted him as my Savior. Good. Is there a storm going on in your life right now? Is there a place where you need King Jesus to come? Because you see, being saved is not a one-time thing. It means to be rescued. It means to be healed. That word had many meanings in, in the original uh, word that, that Peter used. It meant for God to come and fix something that was broken. And life is one of those things that keeps presenting us with new challenges. And maybe you're in a place right now where you say, I need, I need Jesus to come in a new way. Come into my space, into my life, my relationships and do his healing, empowering work, set things right. How many of us would be in a place where we need to see that right now? Just put your hand up. I'm not going to make you do anything. I just want to see. You look around. You can see. You're not alone if you've got your hand up. God wants to touch you right now. So again, let's bow our heads. Father, I pray that through the power of your spirit, that creative spirit, the spirit that created this world at your command, and that spirit that you have poured out through your King Jesus into our lives. That you would come to each person here who is carrying a burden right now. And Lord, you would show them that you're right there with them. And if they will look closely, they will see even in, in the ashes and soot at their feet. Fresh life poking out of the ground. And you're daring them to believe that the new life is going to be better than the old fire or what the fire took away. And so, Lord, I pray that you would just grow that faith in their hearts and surround them with the people that will show your love and pour it into their hearts. Lord, you've made us to be overcomers. And I just pray your healing and blessing in each of those situations in Jesus' name. Let's stand together. And prayer team, come on down. And we'd love to pray with you if you have a special need. Uh, if you're in your seat, you're standing there and... There's someone nearby and you'd like to have them pray for you. Tug on their sleeve and just, you know, just ask them to pray or just put a hand on your shoulder while we have this song and let God touch you where you are. And we would love to certainly pray with you here. So uh, let's sing together.